Dambisa Moyo is an economist and decision maker. She has made a career out of influencing influential people. Born in Zambia, Moyo left in 1991 during a period of political turmoil, moving to the United States to complete a degree in chemistry. She then went on to earn a master's in public administration from Harvard and a doctorate in economics from Oxford. After a stint at the World Bank and Goldman Sachs, she wrote four New York Times bestsellers. In her first, Dead Aid, she argued that aid to Africa effectively perpetuates a vicious cycle of poverty on the continent. In business, Moyo has served on an array of company boards, everything from banking to alcohol to oil. This year, she serves on the board of 3M and Chevron. A self-proclaimed red-blooded capitalist, Moyo has also argued that democracy has failed to deliver economic growth. Time magazine named her one of the most influential people in the world, and leaders want to listen to what she's got to say. Joining us on this edition of Leaders with Lacqua is Dambisa Moyo. Dambisa, thank you so much for joining us. You're really a prolific writer, a great thinker, and that's from everything to capitalism, to boardrooms, to aid to emerging economies and state aid. How will the coronavirus actually change the social contract between a citizen and its government? Thank you so much, Francine. Um, I think there are a, a number of factors and characteristics that to me will dominate the next decade and, and onward, which go to the heart of your question. Um, one government is big and it's getting bigger. If you look over the last 120 years, so really back into the 1900s through um, the 20th century to where we are today, the size of government has uh, only increased in terms of debt, in terms of deficits. And I think that that is a theme that quite clearly will continue regardless of whether we have the, um, the shock of the, uh, of the coronavirus as we're suffering through now. The other aspect of this is I do believe government is becoming much more important. Um, by that, I mean um, more and more we will see the government as an arbiter of capital and labor, which is quite antithetical to the idea of market capitalism, where government remains small. Um, that is really a world that we're moving away from. And I think that that is, is partly in reaction um, to the most recent pandemic, but more generally, we were already heading that way, and especially through cautions from the Congressional Budget Office in terms of government size and ability to really deliver on uh, entitlement programs. But is that a good or a bad thing, Dambiza? So if the government is changing its role, can it actually be more of an arbiter in fairness or inclusive capitalism? So I think that there are many arguments, and as somebody like myself who considers, I consider myself a red-blooded capitalist in the sense that I do believe in globalization. I believe in the role of the private sector as a, an, an allocator of capital and of labor, a driver of productivity, and ultimately um, an important piece of the growth story and narrative for improving living standards. Um, but it's absolutely clear that the government has been a part of that. Um, if you read Margaret O'Mara's book, The Code, um, the government was heavily involved in uh, in aspects of building the Silicon Valley. We know that the government has been a key piece of building internet and, and really being a part of uh, the Manhattan Project, uh, many other areas, infrastructure, public goods in general, education and healthcare in many places around the world. Government is a key driver, a key um, foundation of uh, prospects for improvements in living standards. But it's also really essential to make sure that the regulatory and tax environment continue to be supportive of corporations. And um, I think that that's an imperative um, for innovation, for R&D. Um, it's not just about creating an environment in which corporations can thrive and operate, but it's really about making sure that um, we become a, a competitive environment wherever you are um, for, for businesses to, to continue to invest um, in human capital, but also in, the, in, the, in the more infrastructure and, and capital projects. Bisa, what you're talking about is a pretty significant shift. How much does this have to do with COVID-19 and you know, the fact that maybe the private sector has failed us in certain aspects in dealing with the crisis? And how much does it actually have to do with populism and the fact that globalization was being put in question before COVID-19? So one of the best parts of being uh, grounded at home, I've had a really great chance to do a lot more reading. And one of the things I've done is really look back in history. And if you look at, at, at the period from the Gilded Age, the late 1800s, coming into the 1900s, I think there's a lot of patterns that are repeating themselves. Um, there's a wonderful book by Ron Chernow, 
called Titan on about John D. Rockefeller, um, which, you know, if you think about the 1900s, he was um, really emblematic of the monopolies and the oligopolies that we see today in many different sectors, whether it's in banking or pharmaceuticals, airlines, um, energy companies, technology companies. Um, so there was a lot of um, that picture of where you had the centralization of capital, centralization, a more, much more important, powerful role um, for a relatively small number of corporations. And so do I think it's good or bad? I mean, I think these are normative questions. I think the, the, the fundamental point is that we do need private sector um, at the tip of the spear for the range of the challenges that, that we're facing today. Um, government cannot do it on its own. Um, I know it's becoming very much in vogue now to talk about MMT and mon mon modern monetary theory and the idea that government deficits don't matter. But I think fundamentally, you want to continue to uh, encourage private sector. We need the private sector to help solve everything from climate change um, to uh, concerns around income inequality. Up next on Leaders with LACWA, diversity in the boardrooms. Dambi Zamoyo tells us how boards have changed over the past decade. Ten years ago, I was the only woman, only minority um, for all my boards for some time. I mean, now that would be unheard of. Unprecedented. It's a word we've heard frequently in 2020. The coronavirus pandemic has forced governments and businesses to take steps that were previously unthinkable. And as unemployment rates skyrocket, governments are increasingly playing a bigger role in their economies and in their companies. The Fed is buying corporate debt. Europe is doing its best to keep its private sector afloat. Nobody knows what the long-term consequences will be or who will foot the bill. In Dambiza Moyo's book, Edge of Chaos, Why Democracy is Failing to Deliver Economic Growth and How to Fix It, she argues that contrary to popular belief, economic growth is a prerequisite for democracy and not the other way around. So, is it the government's job to save market capitalism? Dambiza Moyo is still with us. Dambiza, you're also on a number of boards. How will coronavirus, COVID-19 change a lot of how these companies operate? How will it change the boards you sit on? Yeah, so I mean, I think rather than it being a specific point, I mean, I wrote an article in Harvard Business Review uh, recently. We, in the immediacy, we're looking at at issues around operations, you know, questions around the health and safety of the workforce. What is the definition of the workforce? Is it the immediate people that work for you, or is it the people who are in your supply chain or your contracting workers? Um, we've talked about work from home. What are the what are the benefits of that? But what are the risks as well um, to having um, um, our employee base in such a shocking um, and uh, um, urgent way moved them um, to, to work at home. So those are the sort of operational issues. And of course, things like supply chains um, at the macro level, whether they're disrupted, how should we be thinking about that longer term are, are issues. Um, on the financial side, it's liquidity, of course, um, versus solvency, solvency issues, um, issues around activists potentially coming into different stocks, concerns around, um, you know, how do we think longer term about the, the, the raison d'etre of, of a particular business? Um, is this a real viable business model? So those are all aspects that we're thinking about in the immediacy. I think longer term businesses are um, going to be uh, forced to rethink um, of uh, what, what a purposeful, a purpose-built corporation looks like. Um, there's a, so, a whole swathe of challenges um, that you and I know that the economy is uh, dealing with, um, not least of which is income inequality. What is the responsibility of corporations in that environment? And so it's not good enough to have very high level goals. As I, I mentioned earlier, you can say we're going to invest in opportunities, we're going to seek um, gender and racial parity, or we're going to invest more in education. But really, um, to the extent that corporations can deliver um, and CEOs and senior management of companies do deliver on a regular basis um, on costs and on profits and on growth. And um, they are going to be called upon now to be seen as good citizens um, for society. Dambisa, who do you think will drive that change? Is it consumers? Is it clients? Or is it actually shareholders demand that these companies you know, catch up with the 21st century? 
So I'm, I'm generally not of the view that there's a sort of zero sum or us versus them approach. I think, you know, um, you know I, I'm not only a citizen, I'm also a board member, which means that I understand not only as an individual person um, going to the shops as a consumer, but also someone who sits in a boardroom. Um, I understand uh, very deeply um, how these things uh, are, are, are sort of put together. Um, and I think it's really important for us to, to get away from this attack um, sort of negative approach and really to come together to come and find uh, a suite of solutions for these challenges. Um, so yes, in, in some respects, you could I can sit here and say corporations um, are already uh, in, in the forefront of making those changes. The business roundtable last year in August making proclamations around how government, uh, excuse me, how corporations should operate. Government um, and regulators um, changing how they think about engagement um, as arbiters in capital and arbiters of, uh, of how uh, labor is distributed, but also in their own role in the economy. Um, but you know, more generally, yes, you know, we, we are seeing um, much more involvement from um, from the broader society, institutional investors. And I think working together is really critical. Um, I think there's just been far too much of this attitude that you know, it's, it, it's necessarily that we have to pit people against each other. And I think yeah. that that is incredibly deleterious over the long term. Yeah, although, Dambisa, you have a lot of chief executive of listed companies that even signed you know, a letter all together a, you know, a year ago saying that what they feel the pressure on is the, the quarterly results, is the fact that actually quarterly results and the, the pressure to deliver um, for shareholders every three months sometimes means that they take their eye off the longer term goals. And I think, that, isn't that not a fair accusation? Yeah, I think it's a problem in government. It's a problem in corporations. Um, I would dare I say it. I think it's a problem of individuals as well. Um, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm not a, a psychologist, but I think humans find it very difficult to invest for the long term. We want everything here and now. Um, but um, I don't think that just because that's a, a problem doesn't mean it's not being addressed. Um, you know, there are many, many ways in which corporations uh, and boards are getting involved, and, you know, whether it's compensation packages that are focused on long-term benefits and growth of the company um, or, you know, benefits of, uh, of com uh, corporate uh, uh, stakeholder action um, over long-term as being part of a compensation base. So I think there are a lot of innovative um, uh, and new ways of thinking around the long-term that are, are being um, considered and, and being discussed. Uh, how have changed? You know, how have boards changed actually since you joined them? I mean, you, you've been sitting on boards for so many years. Have they yeah. changed in their way of thinking? I know, again, we're generalizing, but yes. actually, <laughs> does it touch the fabric of a board? Oh yes, absolutely. So I've been on boards um, just over ten years now, and um, I, I think it's it's absolutely the case that when I first joined. The, um, the focus was really on the, the first two key, key areas of, of board responsibility. It was about setting the strategy or at least supporting management and setting the strategy for the corporation. And it was also very much about um, thinking about succession. You know, how do you hire a CEO? What kind of CEO do we need in a particular time? Um, that has changed to add on a very key aspect of, uh, of board responsibility, which is about culture. Um, and into very fast uh, moving, really um, quick changing environment, a rapidly changing environment of what culture means. And it, you know, it very, it's shorthand is, you know, it's beyond the things that I would say are non-negotiable, things like excellence and professionalism and trust are, are things that we all agree. And in that respect, we think a lot about implementing those, making sure they're deeply ingrained in an organization. But then there's a whole world of other cultural challenges that are very new, um, what I would say on the cultural frontier, things like a uh, pay parity, um, gender and racial yeah. um, uh, equality in the workforce, um, issues around climate change, uh, you know, worker advocacy, data privacy. I mean, there's a whole slew of these issues where corporations are being asked to opine and to take a, a more leadership role. And I think boards have, have really taken that role on as well. When did that start? So there has been a very clear lack of diversity on boards. And again, I know you don't want to put an, a, you know, an us and them, but what's made the change? Was it business sense? I know a couple of years ago, we were also talking about the lack of technologists or technology officers on boards. How mm -hmm. have you seen this shift? 
Yeah, so I think you know, it's hard for me to pinpoint a specific date. I think it's for sure um, the one watershed moment was 2008 with the financial crisis. I think to me, at least to my understanding, it felt like that became a much more uh, a, a prominent issue around what's going on in the boardrooms, how should we be thinking about the um, the, the board, um, but also how do the, the corporations that are charged with um, being part of this um, challenge, these challenges around the world. So I think that that was a particular uh, watershed moment. But you know, I, you know, I know people um, like myself get frustrated um, or even get uh, maybe sometimes disheartened. Um, but if we take a step back, I think a lot of progress has been made vis-a-vis -vis, um, women and minorities in the boardroom. Um, you know, when I first joined my first boards, you know, ten years ago, I was the only woman, only minority um, for all my boards for some time. I mean, now that would be unheard of, and it is unheard of, I'm, and I'm delighted to serve on the board and really have work with uh, senior women and minorities. Um, and it's an imperative that I understand, you know, corporations understand. I don't think that it's up for debate anymore. And I, I really do think that companies understand the value of that in terms of their own decision making. D does a diverse board automatically mean a diverse workforce, or does it change the culture of a company? It's a great question. Um, I think that it's a start. Um, obviously, there's lots of people talk about how you need to, uh, to see role models for there to be a much more of a groundswell within the, the ranks of the organization. I think that's where a lot more work um, needs to be done. Work has been done, um, but you know, it, again, very much the way we're deliberate about um, assigning accountability to a CEO and saying, hey, listen, we need you to focus on cost restructuring or we need you to focus on profit growth. Um, in much that same way, we have asked the CEOs and senior leadership to be accountable for um, delivering on um, more gender representation. We've been, we forced them to be more focused on issues around climate change. Um, and so I think that um, having not just assigning accountability to senior leaders, but actually forcing people to have a more granular approach approach um, to, uh, to how they're going to execute. So whether it's about uh, attaching compensation to how many people of diverse backgrounds you have in your team, um, that those types of initiatives are things that we need to be debating um, and to, to see whether there'll be progress. But I'm, I'm overall very optimistic. I don't think that uh, corporations have uh, a, a sort of ill ill uh, intent. I just think that um, we do need to move away from the large platitudes into more granularity for execution. Up next, the economics of freedom. Dambiza Moyo dives into the subject of her next book. I've rarely heard an economist speak about freedom. Do we take it for granted? Um, I'm not sure we take it for granted. I just don't think we understand fully what the social costs of our private freedoms are. As China is poised to become the world's largest creditor, concerns about sustainability are growing as fast as the debt itself. The majority of China's low-income borrowers are in Africa. The World Bank estimates China holds 17% of the continent's debt. So what happens when a government runs into trouble repaying its Chinese loans? Dambisa Moyo says that the West should be careful not to point the finger at China's practices in Africa. Her first book, Dead Aid, shook up the way nations think about foreign relief. We're back with Dambiza Moya. Dambiza, you're a thought leader. Who's shaped you, the, you know, the person you are? What's your, your first memory of looking at economics or leadership roles? Well, I think that um, for me, I, you know, I was born and raised in Africa, um, and I'm so uh, honored, and it's just been a great privilege for me to be able to live in the West, um, to travel to around 80 countries around the world, um, to do business in those places, but to really understand that ultimately human progress is essential. Um, and I think that just having that sort of uh, understanding that there is not one path towards economic success. I feel very honored to be living in this period because um, you know, it's not a fait accompli that market capitalism is the answer. We're clearly um, being forced um, in boardrooms and corporations and governments to rethink how strident we are about market capitalism and liberal democracy. It's not to say we don't have any values. It's just to say, well, actually, maybe we do need a bigger 
government role in these it, at these times or even in longer period um, beyond uh, crises. Um, there's also clearly a recognition that the success of China is something that we need to think about in terms of um, you know what does that mean for globalization, for global operations, global engagement, cooperation. Um, you know we can't we can't just rule it out and say it's all bad. They've obviously been incredibly successful in moving you know a large proportion of their population out of poverty. What are the learnings from there? Um, and so I tend to um, read very widely. Um, I I feel very fortunate because being born and raised in Africa means that I don't have a sort of a priori um, view or ideology of how the world works. I've definitely have skewed and, and lean much more to market capitalists and liberal democratic. But I think that uh, we are in a time of challenge. And you know, given that it's only been 1% of human history in which we've had liberal democracies, um, I, and given everything that's happened, the populism backlash that we've experienced across Europe and, and in the United States, I think um, it really does test uh, economists and public policymakers to, and business people to think about how we navigate challenges and being much more open-minded to different ideas. Well, will one of the threads in the next five to 10 years be this continuing trade war or for global supremacy between the US and China? And what does that mean for the rest of the world? Yeah, so, you know, Francine, I think there are a number of things that will characterize um, the next stage of where we are. I think one is the size of government. Size Government is big, it's getting bigger. Um, the import of government, which I just talked about in terms of arbiter of capital and labor, government is getting more important in the economy. Um, you're absolutely right. I think that they, there's a risk because of deglobalization and a greater balkanization of the world that we end up with um, relatively fewer publicly traded companies. Already we're down 50% in the last decade or so um, of companies that trade publicly on stock markets in the United States and elsewhere. Um, but also more concentration, um, as I touched on earlier, more concentration of, uh, of companies, large companies, in different sectors, but you know this this world that we're entering, I do worry very greatly that we're moving more and more away um, from a, a globalized world in all areas, in trade, in capital, in, in you know movement of people through immigration, and in the move in, in sort of a split in ideas. So um, I'm afraid that 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 seems to be much more of an appealing uh, approach in the short term when you have concerns around employment um, and a lot of the other issues around income inequality as well. Denvisa, what does that mean for some of the emerging economies that used to rely quite a lot on the United States? And in many cases, we've seen China actually fill that vacuum. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, th I think that there is a reset um, that has happened. It's, uh, you know, it's still in train in many respects, but I think this has been going on for some time. Um, China is not just the largest foreign direct investor um, and, and trading partner in, uh, in large Western countries. It is also you know, very much a, a key player in many developing countries. Um, and it's gone beyond that. Um, as you know, there are real issues now around debt. Um, the Chinese, gov you know, Chinese uh, state and, uh, uh, has essentially purchased um, um, secondary debt. So it's trade, it's foreign direct investment, it's around lending um, through uh, bonds. And, um, and so the, the tentacles of China uh, across the emerging markets in, in Africa and South America and Asia is, is only increasing. Um, I think that th there has to be more engagement. And this is why, once again, um, making sure that we remain more cooperative than uh, sort of a finger pointing, I think, is, is a really much better approach to solving these human problems. What's your next book on? Um, my next book is actually about freedom, um, the price of freedom. Um, I am doing some work as well around corporate governance right now, um, not really specifically corporate governance, but governance in general, um, which is related to this idea of um, split ideology. Uh, how do we, how should we think about engaging with different ideologies um, without losing ourselves, our own value compass? So it's, it's those types of ideas. I mean, I've never or I've rarely heard an economist speak about freedom. Do we take it for granted? Um, I'm not sure we take it for granted. I just don't think we understand fully what the social costs of our private freedoms are. Um, and I wonder you know, very much whether if we understood how our individual private behaviors really influence the social costs for society in its entirety, whether that might influence how we behave and how we change our, our actions. Dembiza Moyo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Francine. Thank you.